Hello, my name is Kathleen Gura. I'm a pharmacist at Boston Children's Hospital and an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School. Today's presentation will focus on the micronutrient needs of the preterm infant. Uh, these are my disclosures. And the learning objectives for today's session are, upon completion of this lecture, the participant should be able to recognize the complications of iron deficiency as they relate to neurocognitive development, understand the challenges in assessing micronutrient status, describe how contamination of the components we use to compound PN may provide sufficient amounts of some trace elements. There are many factors that increase the risk of micronutrient deficiency in the preterm infant. First off, the accretion of the trace elements occurs during the last trimester of uh, pregnancy. So as a result, there are low micronutrient stores at birth, and also these infants undergo rapid postnatal growth, and we simply don't know many of the requirements necessary for many micronutrients. Now, human milk, our gold standard, is it really adequate for the preterm infant? There are numerous factors that do impact its ability to be the sole source of micronutrients in this vulnerable population. There's a lot of variability in the composition of human milk, also, we rely heavily on HMF or human milk fortifier. And lastly, is there even a true gold standard for this population? There are some micronutrients which are unable to match into uterine accretion rates, such as iron and iodine. Also, there are other micronutrients that are able to duplicate this um, into uterine accretion rate, including copper and zinc. As a result, there are numerous challenges associated with supplementation. We need to make sure that the intake is enough that it prevents over deficiencies. We also need to make sure that the amount is enough to allow for proper accretion of the stores that should have incurred naturally in utero had the infant delivered at term. And lastly, we don't want to give too much. We don't want to cause a toxic situation. The first micronutrient I'd like to talk about in this presentation is iron. It's critical for organ development and it's the most abundant transition metal in the human brain. In the fetus and the newborn, iron is actually prior to prioritized for red blood cell production at the expense of other tissues. In fact, 75% of our neonatal iron body stores is transferred in the third trimester. As a result, premature neonates are at increased risk for congenital iron deficiency. And up to 80% of our total body iron stores are located within our red blood cells. A healthy term infant has sufficient iron stores to last at least four to six months of age. Uh, also due to their higher blood volume is relative to their body weight. So it's crucial that we optimize iron levels in the newborn. It, it supports erythropoiesis, growth, and brain development, but we have to maintain a careful balance to avoid deficiency and we don't want to cause toxicity. There are numerous factors impacting iron status at birth, including fetal blood loss, such as fetal maternal hemorrhage, as well as twin to twin hemorrhage, gestational diabetes, maternal iron status, as well as placental insufficiency and timing of cord clamping. Iron stores in preterm infants tend to be lower in comparison to term infants, and preterm infant stores are often depleted by two to three uh, months of age. So why are premature infants at greatest risk for iron deficiency? Well, as mentioned before, premature infants do lack sufficient iron stores. In fact, the more, it's more severe in our lower gestational age infants. Also, premature infants experience an exaggerated anemia of prematurity in comparison to term infants. And that's for many reasons, including lower levels of erythropoietin, shortened red blood cell survival, as well as a relatively rapid period of postnatal growth with a greater hemoglobin synthesis to support the blood volume expansion that occurs. A small circulating blood volume relative to the iatrogenic blood loss is the most predominant factor, however, and we term that anemia of phlebotomy. And again, there are many risk factors associated with congenital iron deficiency in this population. 17% uh, of all premature infants do have iron deficiency. But as mentioned before, maternal obesity, maternal diabetes, as well as maternal smoking increase the risk of iron deficiency, as well as untreated maternal iron deficiency. Uh, both small and large for gestational age neonates have higher risk of iron deficiency, as well as those in multifetal pregnancies, the male gender, and those babies in medically underserved populations, and such as patients in lower socioeconomic uh, classes. So what is the role of iron in uh, 
neurodevelopment. Normally, 75% of a neonate's uh, total body iron stores are transferred in the third trimester. Thus, premature neonates are already at risk for congenital iron deficiency. And up to 80% of the total body iron that's stored is found in the red blood cells. And at birth, fetal hypoxia, maternal diabetes, and placental insufficiency, coupled with uh, EPO production, drives iron utilization. In fact, iron is prioritized for red blood cells at the expense of the brain and other body organs. Most healthy term infants born after an uncomplicated pregnancy have sufficient iron stores to last them up to four to six months of age because their uh, higher blood volume relative to their body weight allows for this. For neonates with congenital iron deficiency, human milk is a ne negligible form of an iron source because iron is relatively low in human milk. It's around 0.35 milligrams per liter. There are two common time periods where iron deficiency is evident. Firstly, in the prenatal neonatal period, and secondly, six months to the first 24 months of life. In the United States, up to 10% of infants in the first two years of life exhibit some form of iron deficiency. The higher risk of this occurs during periods of rapid brain growth. And as I've already mentioned in the previous slides, there are many causes for this. Um, as, and I, as you can see here, I'm including the low uh, maternal stores, diabetes, and uterine growth retardation. Um, also, we can see blood loss and milk protein intolerance and breastfeeding. This slide shows the classic picture of iron deficiency anemia. It's a hypochromic microcytic anemia. Uh, you can see, also see low ferritin and low total iron stores, but caution when interpreting them because it is influenced by inflammation. And you will also see an elevated total iron binding capacity. Uh, so what is the significance of iron deficiency? As I keep stressing, early identification of neonates at risk is imperative because infants who are born with congenital iron deficiency or even acquired during their early um, postnatal period are at risk for many adverse long-term neurocognitive, sensory, and or behavioral consequences. Uh, iron deficiency has been shown to have a negative impact on cell division, neuronal growth, dendrite branching, as well as myelination as, and neurotransmitter production in both sensory organs and the hippocampal memory centers. There are many consequences associated with iron deficiency. Uh, those occurring in the late prenatal neonatal period include changes in temperament, abnormal memory and recognition, mental as well as psychomotor deficits, as well as auditory impact. Uh, for infants from 6 months to 24 months of age, iron deficiency has been associated with lower IQ scores, a slower processing speed, attention deficits, as well as behavioral deficits. In older children, neurobehavioral signs can appear if the child had iron deficiency as an infant. And that can be uh, exhibited as sleep disturbances, breath holding spells, febrile seizures, uh, restless legs, irritability, apathy, and depression. In fact, the adverse neurobehavioral impact is most pronounced and persistent in those cases of iron deficiency that occurred in the first few days of active brain development. Iron supplementation is somewhat controversial because short-term therapy may prevent or treat iron deficiency. And when do we start? Do we start immediately after birth? Do we wait two weeks? Do we wait a month? And what products do we use and how do we dose it? Typically, it's one to two milligrams per kilo per day in a term neonate, up to two to four milligrams per kilo per day in a preterm infant. However, if the baby is receiving any kind of erythropoietin stimulating agents, the dose increases to two to six milligrams per kick per day because of increased iron utilization. Now with iron supplementation, it doesn't have to be parenteral iron. Oral iron has been shown to be effective in improving iron status in infants with iron deficiency. In one systematic review of low birth weight infants, uh, doses between 0.6 to 6 mg per kg per day of oral iron started between the first and fifth week of age prevented iron deficiency anemia at 6 to 12 months of age. Uh, and as a reminder, red blood cell transfusions are an excellent source of iron. Uh, and those infants that benefit most are the very low birth weight infants, especially if they have a lower initial hemoglobin, have undergone immediate cord clamping, have experienced greater phlebotomy losses, and are more seriously ill. Now I'd like to switch gears and talk about zinc. 
Zinc as a second most abundant trace element in the body is the most abundant intracellular trace element that's involved in more than 300 zinc-containing enzymes. Uh, zinc is required for cellular division and differentiation, regulation of apoptosis, and it has an important role in vision. Uh, zinc is involved in vitamin A transport, it's a component of retinal binding protein, as well as being involved in rhodopsin synthesis. Zinc is involved in regulation of gene expression of several transcription factors, and as a reminder, most of our uh, fetal accretion occurs during that last trimester of gestation with a daily accretion rate of 840 mics per kilo per day for infants between 24 to 34 weeks gestation. Also, the fractional rate of zinc absorption is inversely related to the amount of the zinc in the intestine. Uh, zinc is absorbed in the duodenum as well as proximal jejunum, and its absorption can be enhanced in the presence of citric acid. However, zinc can be uh, inhibited by iron as well as fiber. And when we add cysteine to our parenteral nutrition solution to enhance calcium phosphorus solubility, that may also negatively impact our zinc status because it does increase urinary zinc losses. Now zinc deficiency um, has some classic uh, characteristics. It's associated with uh, alopecia as well as anorexia. There is decreased protein synthesis as well as um, a decreased host defense. Uh, classically, we think of growth failure when we think of zinc deficiency as well as poor wound healing. The skin lesions like you see in this uh, photograph are called acrodermatitis and typically that's with severe cases of zinc deficiency. In fact, it's very difficult to identify subclinical zinc deficiency cases. Um, one trick that I know in practice we've always um, learned was low uh, alkaline phosphatase levels is an indirect way of suggesting you have a zinc deficiency occurring. So it's an, uh, more accurate actually than measuring uh, serum zinc levels. Now zinc concentrations in human milk will vary. Uh, it's the highest in colostrum at 4.4 milligrams per liter, while transitional preterm milk starts off at 4.8 milligrams per liter but by the time at three months of lactation, it's down to 1.1 milligrams per liter. So thus, unfortified human milk is unlikely to meet the needs of a preterm infant. When we add human milk fortify, that provides additional seven to 10 milligrams of zinc per liter. And when we talk about commercial formulas, preterm formula contains eight to 12 milligrams per liter of zinc, while full term infant formula contains five to seven milligrams per liter of zinc, reflecting the different needs. Now, infants that require zinc supplementation, uh, typically if they're enterally fed, they'll get a dose of 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo per day. Those receiving PN get doses of around 400 micrograms per kilo per day. However, extremely premature infants or those with excessive GI losses may need more as they'll be losing a lot from the um, output. So how do we uh, monitor zinc status? As I mentioned before, we kind of use indirect measures because there's no single test that reliably reflects whole body zinc status. If uh, we look at plasma zinc, that does respond in a dose-dependent manner to supplementation. So, but however, it does have some drawbacks. It's influenced by the acute phase response and albumin status. And again, I like to use alkaline phosphatase because alkaline phosphatase is a zinc-requiring enzyme. So low alkaline phosphatate levels are suggestive of zinc deficiency, and you'll see the alkaline phosphatase levels rise as you replete with zinc. For the remainder of this presentation, I'd like to discuss other trace elements, including copper, selenium, chromium, iodide, and manganese. Uh, the first trace element I'd like to discuss is copper. Uh, those stores accumulate during that last trimester of development. Uh, in utero, the copper accretion rate is approximately 30 micrograms per kilo per day. And the current recommendations for copper include the enteral uh, route is 120 to 150 micrograms per kilo per day, while parental copper is 16 to 20 mics per kilo per day. Uh, both human uh, milk as well as preterm formula meet the estimated daily copper requirement if the infant consumes 150 mils per kilo per day. However, the concentration, while it's high in early human milk, it will start declining with lactation, and the risk of deficiency is greater between five weeks to eight months postnatally in the preterm infant. As a re and also, we've seen cases of copper deficiency occur in those uh, preterm infants who receive copper-free PN. 
How do we assess copper status? Um, to assess deficiency, we will measure um, plasma copper or sapruloplasm concentrations. However, there is limited utility in those marginal cases of subclinical copper deficiency. Uh, normally, a serum concentration of copper will be less than 35 micrograms per deciliter. Uh, this slide summarizes some of the uh, key clinical uh, manifestations of copper deficiency. You see a hypochromic mycocytic anemia similar to iron deficiency anemia, and it's often picked up when you uh, supplement with iron and the child fails to respond. Apnea as well as neutropenia have been seen with copper deficiency, as well as osteoporosis and thrombocytopenia. Uh, the metabolic bone disease that you do see with copper deficiency, uh, the, the it's around, uh, typically around, you see metathesial changes that are oftentimes mistaken for uh, child abuse with the fractures. And if you see an osteoporosis from inadequate protein matrix formation, and what results is a wide space ground glass trabecular pattern. So again, it's very distinctive of copper deficiency. The next trace element I'd like to discuss is selenium. Uh, selenium stores are naturally low at birth. Uh, selenium does serve as an antioxidant and has been shown to be protective for infants against oxygen-free radical damage. Uh, by giving uh, selenium supplementation, it's been shown to decrease infection rates in this population. The recommended daily dose for enteral and parenteral to selenium ranges from 1.3 to 3 micrograms per kilo per day. Uh, there are various ways to monitor uh, selenium status, including a functional status marker, glutathione peroxidase. Uh, we can also check serum selenium concentrations, which reflects recent intake. And the best marker for long-term uh, intake is the serum erythrocyte concentration, which reflects um, long-term over 120 uh, day uh, period of intake. The next trace element I'd like to discuss is iodine. It's an important component of thyroid hormone production. Uh, and it's been shown that maternal iodine deficiency is associated with severe impairment in both growth as well as neurodevelopment. However, excessive iodine intake has been associated with hypothyroidism. Uh, premature infants have immature regulatory mechanisms, and intrathyroidal uh, iodine stores are able to sustain thyroid hormone production for only three months. And in the United States, iodine is routinely not added to PN. And in fact, because of changes in practice, negative iodine balance has been seen in infants and children receiving prolonged courses of iodine-free PN. And that may be our change from using uh, betadine in our dressings to chlorhexidine, which is iodine-free. And as a result, we're seeing changes in iodine status. Uh, this slide shows um, an example of uh, severe hypothyroidism from iodine deficiency that was associated with uh, parental nutrition. In this case, uh, they used urine iodine concentrations to determine the iodine status. And at week one, you see the child is severely deficient. And after receiving 12 weeks of repletion, the baby was able to um, maintain a normal iodine status. Uh, typically, uh, the patients at greatest risk, it's very rare to see iodine deficiency, but those babies and children receiving long-term exclusive PM without iodine supplementation are at greatest risk. So as a result, it's prudent to um, recheck a child's iodine status after three to two to three months after starting PM that's iodine free. The suggested dosing for iodine supplementation in PN fed infants and children is uh, one microgram per kilo per day, and that comes from the European Society for Parental and Nutrition (ESPN), because because in Europe they do have uh, trace element products that do contain iodine. Uh, we currently don't have these products in the U.S. Uh, for monitoring, as mentioned previously, we look at urinary iodine. Uh, we can do a 24-hour urine collection. Uh, the goal is to have the uh, urine uh, iodine concentrations between 100 and 199 micrograms per liter. And we can also use surrogate markers of iodine status, such as serum thyroxine levels and TSH levels. Now, for the remaining portion of my talk, I'd like to talk about the role of the contamination as it relates to being a source of trace elements. There are numerous sources of trace element contamination in the PN additives and devices that we use to compound parental nutrition solutions. For example, needles are often contaminated with both chromium and manganese. Our glass vials can contain zinc. The rubber stoppers that are used in those vials can also have zinc contamination. Iron dextrin and sodium phosphate have been shown to be contaminated with both chromium and manganese. And magnesium sulfate can also contain manganese contamination. 
Uh, chromium is one of these trace elements I'd like to discuss. Uh, and infants between 0 to 6 and 7 to 12 months of age have been shown to receive more than enough of the aspen recommended chromium intake simply through contamination. Uh, chromium is involved in glucose homeostasis. It promotes the activity of the insulin receptor and it enhances glucose intake. And when we're chromium deficient, we see uh, glucose intolerance as well as weight loss and neuropathy. What's interesting to report is we have not seen cases of chromium deficiency in infants fed their mother's own milk, which suggests that chromium uh, content in human milk is sufficient. Uh, also for monitoring, it's been shown that serum chromium levels may not reflect total chromium body stores. Uh, if you really need to know a patient's chromium status, hair chromium might be a better way to assess it. Now this slide is from a, some research that came out of Canada that looked at the impact of uh, trace element contamination and pediatric parental nutrition solutions. And what they did was they looked at the ordered amount of the trace element and compared it to what was actually measured in the PN solution. And as you can see here in this case, the ordered amount of chromium is much lower than what was actually seen in the PN solution, suggesting there was significant contamination. And that brings me to our next trace element, manganese. Uh, it's, as you saw in that previous slide, contamination may provide sufficient manganese. Up to 120% of the aspirin recommended requirements for manganese uh, metalloenzymes uh, may be achieved simply through contamination. It's really rare to become uh, manganese deficient. In those cases where they've able to do manganese um, deficiency, uh, skin rash as well as hypocholesterolemia, growth failure, and osteoporosis have occurred. We're more familiar, however, with manganese toxicity, which has been associated with seizures, irritability, as well as a Parkinsonian-like uh, symptoms. Uh, the risk factors for manganese toxicity include pre-existing iron deficiency, as well as selenium deficiency, and liver disease. Uh, for monitoring, if we're going to check a manganese level, it's mostly to determine if a patient's deficient. If you want to assess for toxicities, we look at either blood or urine. And if the patient does have an elevated blood or urine manganese level, it's suggested to uh, get an MRI. And as you saw the slide previously, it's in the same study from Canada. Uh, as you can see here, in this case, the patient wasn't even ordered manganese in their PN, yet the contamination had significant amounts of manganese present. The key takeaways from this brief lecture are that all essential micronutrients and microminerals are necessary to optimize growth and development. Uh, premature infants are born at great risk for deficiencies due to their low stores as well as their increased requirements because of the rapid growth they undergo. Uh, primary prevention of deficiencies is critical in this population. Uh, this slide just summarizes the AAP's recommendations for preterm enteral intakes for the various trace elements we've talked about in this lecture. This slide summarizes the aspirin preterm recommended intakes from infants receiving parenteral nutrition. Uh, you'll notice here, unlike the aspirin guidelines, there is no recommendation for iodine or iron. And these are the references. This video was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant from Reckitt Mead Johnson. This five-part video series on the nutrition requirements and feeding issues for the preterm infant will be available on the Aspen website at nutritioncare.org forward slash neonatal care resources.